Robin Stone, who is Gerald Boyd? Gerald Boyd was many people. Um, he was a complicated man, um, having grown up in St. Louis um, in poverty, raised by his grandmother after his mother died and his father left for better parts of uh, New York City, uh, came up in poverty um, and worked his way up. Uh, decided he wanted to be a newspaper man. Um, early on in his teenage years, in uh, the 11th grade, um, and pursued that through a scholarship at the University of Missouri, working at the Post-Dispatch in St. Louis, his hometown. Um, very early on, he thought, I want to be a journalist and I want to be good enough to work at the New York Times. And it's that grit and that tenacity that enabled him to overcome all the barriers that he faced. Um, so he was, he, he was uh, a, a mix of those people as well as a young man who was mentored by uh, the Jewish shop owners in his neighborhood. Um, so he had some influence from the Coopers, uh, as well as um, a rabble rouser on campus at University of Missouri. He flexed newfound black power in the early 70s. He walked around with a big afro and a dashiki, talking about power to the people, uh, all of that. Uh, was Gerald Boyd, including the, um, the manager who eventually ended up at the New York Times rising in the ranks, having covered uh, Reagan in the White House and Bush in the White House. As a reporter. As a reporter. Um, tapped for the New York for Times. For the New York Times and, and as a reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch as well. Uh, so he, he was all of these, all of these many facets uh, made up Gerald Boyd. And your husband. And my husband. How long um, were you all married? <laughs> we were married 10 years. Um, there's a love story that's a part of my times in black and white. It's, a, it's about journalism. It's about the New York Times. There's some juicy stuff about the times, but ultimately, I call this book a success story because it's about this man who, as a young, young man, was on a mission, um, and he ultimately achieved that mission. Um, but he was also in search of not just professional excellence, but um, a family, the family he had lost as a child, um, and he wanted that so much. So there's this, this personal growth story as well as this professional growth story. And I was fortunate to be a part of both um, because at one point he was my boss <laughs> as well. He recruited me and hired me at the New York Times, so I worked for him for a while. When did Gerald Boyd die? What was his final position at the New York Times and why did he leave? Hmm. Gerald died in uh, 2006, November. Uh, Thanksgiving Day, actually, a very rainy Thanksgiving Day. Unexpected? Uh, no, he had cancer, uh, lung cancer, and uh, he had. Smoker? He, he was a smoker. He had been diagnosed that February. Uh, so it, it came quickly. Um, he died uh, three years after leaving the New York Times um, in the wake of the Jason Blair plagiarism scandal. And when I go to universities and I talk about Gerald's story to journalism students. I ask how many people have heard of Jason Blair and I see a lot of hands. And then I ask, before you heard of me coming here, how many people had heard of Gerald Boy? Very few hands. And that's one of the reasons I'm telling his story um, because uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating tale, American tale, but it's also a tale about journalism in many respects. So. Um, he was managing editor at the time. Under, uh, under Hal Raines? Hal Raines. He and Hal uh, were um, tapped by Arthur Sulzberger Jr. six days before 9-11 to lead the paper. So six days into the job, they're, you know, we're all hit with this tragedy, um, international terrorism. And so they are thrown into covering the 9-11 the, the um, terrorist attacks, the wars in Afghanistan, wars in Iraq, and they're pushing to establish their mandate on the paper and put their people in place. And the, the staff was taxed and tired and, um, you know, pushed and pulled in all kinds of directions. And, and I call that the kindling um, of the situation, the environment there. And then along comes Jason Blair, this young reporter who plagiarized, stole from other people's stories and made stuff up out of whole cloth. And it was, he was discovered, and I call that the match that lit the fire. 
um, ignited um, all of the unrest and, and uneasiness and unhappiness. And so ultimately, in the wake of the scandal, Hal and Gerald were asked to leave the Times. The fact that Jason Blair was African American, was that important? Absolutely. Um, it was important um, in how the story played out. Um, it, I don't think it was important in the, the fact that he was uh, a plagiarist. Um, Jason Blair was troubled and he acknowledged that he had mental, emotional difficulties and that all played out at the New York Times. But the fact that he was black led some people to assume that Gerald, an African American man, who promoted diversity in the newsroom was in some way aiding and abetting this journalistic criminal when that was not the case. And, and in fact, um, you know, J Jason did not like Gerald, as he wrote in his own book, because uh, he could not get the support that he needed from Gerald. Uh, so Gerald didn't hire Jason, he didn't supervise him directly, and he certainly did not mentor him. But the assumption was that there was a connection between the two. And I think that uh, affected Gerald's uh, tenure, and the end of his tenure, uh, quite significantly. Your husband died in 2006. Yes. Four years later, you're publishing a book with his name on it, an introduction by you. It, well, I, I did the afterword. Uh, My Times in Black and White is Gerald's book. He, after he left the Times, he wrote a draft. Uh, he wrote two drafts, actually. It was, uh, the first one was 800 and some odd pages. And I remember telling him, nobody cares about the kids from the old neighborhood. Take some of that stuff out. And then he wrote uh, a shorter version, 250 pages, and I felt it was too truncated. He, it started with him entering the newsroom, and I said, wait, what about the rest of the story before that? So I married the two. Um, after he died and I finally gathered myself together, I knew that this was a story that needed to be told. So I uh, married the two versions and put on my reporter's hat and interviewed some folks, Sidney Cooper, the, the Jewish store owner from back in the neighborhood. I interviewed his aunts, uh, Aunt Laura and Aunt Rose, who's no longer with us, to fill in the gaps. I interviewed his first wife um, to um, get some color for their wedding, to help fill in some of the blanks, and also to describe Anna, who was the woman who Gerald left his first wife, Sheila, for. And Sheila put on her journalist hat and graciously answered my questions. So, um, so I did a little work, but it, it was for the most part Gerald's book. These are his words and it's his story. Sounds a little tricky there. It Some was, of the interviews um, you had to do. It was, they, were, they were a challenge, but um, you know, all in the name of good journalism. <laughs> Tell us about yourself, Robin Stone. Um, well, I'm a journalist, uh, about 20 some odd years in the business, and I've, um, Gerald used to say I couldn't keep a job. I've worked at um, several newspapers, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Detroit Free Press, magazines including Essence Magazine and Health Magazine, uh, developed Essence's website, uh, Essence.com. So I've, I've done a number of things. I'm an author myself, uh, No Secrets, No Lies, How Black Families Can Heal from Sexual Abuse, which came out in 2004. Um, and now I'm an editor of uh, my late husband's book. Uh, so, and I'm looking forward to doing more good journalism in the future. What should people know or remember about Gerald Boyd? I think they should come away from his story with a true sense of the depth of his character and of his humanity. Um, that he came from next to nothing. Uh, growing up so poor they couldn't afford lunch. They had breakfast and dinner. And, and strove, in spite incredible odds, um, to do what I call social justice through journalism, illuminating the situations that people live in, illuminating what's happening on a national level, um, and also that he cared about ethics, uh, about diversifying the newsroom, and he preached something called diversity of thought, not just people of different colors around the table, but um, people who came from different backgrounds, people who, 
grew up poor like he did. You know, people who um, had Jewish mentors, if you will, but who connected with people across um, different ethnic and racial boundaries. That was all what he was about. And I hope that people get a true sense of um, the man and his character and his humanity. Now, some of you